Hi everyone, this is Don Copy. I'm here today with uh, Laura Jo Leifers, who's a talented construction attorney, <laughs> and uh, she'll be doing most of the speaking, and I get to be the color man. Uh, thank you for uh, coming along. Uh, this is the introduction to uh, the AIA 201. Um, it's the uh, first sessions of a series of uh, 12 sessions based on the CSI's Project Delivery Practice Guide. Uh, there's several questions on the exam if you're going to take the exam that come directly from uh, this, these general conditions. And keep in mind that it really is the basis of the administrative thought for the remainder of the questions. Uh, therefore, you need to be very familiar with this document. Uh, a copy of the A201 commentary would also be very helpful uh, to help understand this document. And that commentary is available through the AIA website. Two terms to uh, keep in mind as we go through here. Uh, one is the term of general conditions and versus the term of general requirement. Uh, we'll talk in another session about the fact that there's, we, we love to use the word general at CSI. And uh, general conditions is a is division zero document. It talks about the general conditions for the contract, of the contract for construction. General requirements are the administrative portions of the specifications, typically referred to as, as Division I, um, which we'll cover at a later date. Keep in mind that uh, general conditions is considered the five-star general. This course is, of course, approved for AIA CEU units. Keep in mind that the CDT exam is based upon both the AIA and the EJCDC documents. Uh, however, uh, the documents are very similar, and the AIA document is more widely used in, in the construction of facilities. The EJCDC documents is mostly used during uh, for, for civil engineers. Um, there's also called the consensus documents. They were developed and put in place uh, from the perspective of all the project delivery stakeholders. We'll touch base on them also in this course, but uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time. Instead, it's best to focus on the A201. There might be a couple of questions on the uh, differences between the AIA uh, general conditions and the EJCDC uh, general conditions, uh, and we'll cover that as part of the uh, uh, sample quizzes. Uh, although the, they're really just minor uh, changes in, in uh, terminologies for certain items. A little bit of history of, of general conditions. Um, keep in mind that why are they called general conditions? Uh, and, and back in the day, and the architects uh, in the late 1800s, around 1889, uh, we're seeing more and more projects being built under the design build delivery method. Uh, with contractor developed contracts and, and they weren't very friendly to the uh, to the architects nor the owners so the uh, group of our architects got together and, and formed the AIA and working with their uh, with their attorneys developed a set of standard terms and conditions it was an easy sell to the industry uh, because uh, the terms and conditions to the owners and the general contractors, they appreciated having a standard set of general conditions. Uh, keep in mind, they are slightly slanted towards protection of the architect, some, some, some do say. Uh, but the idea is, is that if you have a quote unquote general condition, then that way every time when you bid on a project as a general contractor, you don't need to um, uh, have your lawyer look at the conditions and. Uh, terms and conditions of the contract, because you'd be very familiar with them from your previous jobs. And thus began, uh, began the term of general conditions of a contract. Keep in mind, uh, um, like we said, that they're based on, on both the, uh, the exam is based on both the EJCDC and the um, AIA 201. Um, the, Consensus docs uh, created with the Associated General Contractors of America. And, and also keep in mind that large clients and other government organizations, your, your 
departments of transportation and such, they've got their own versions of general conditions. Uh, and they're, they're, but really the AIA is sort of the grandfather of them all. Um, so if you're familiar with the, uh, with the AIA documents, um, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be, uh, uh, familiar with, with most of, most of the other ones, fairly familiar. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Doe Weefers, and I'm an attorney over in St. Pete, Florida. I practice construction, construction law, uh, focusing on construction defect litigation. I know that a phrase that no one really likes to hear, but um, I work at Moyer Law Group, and I just wanted to do a quick note uh, before we uh, get started in the substance of the presentation that you know this information that's going to be presented is not uh, meant to be considered legal advice. Um, and it's not meant to be acted on as such. So, you know, some of these things are may not be current or need to be updated with regard to the current law. Um, so, uh, just by participating in the webinar, uh, the presentation that you are not, uh, you do not become a client of Moyer Law Group. So, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly, um, and we can get started. So. Sounds like a great disclaimer. <laughs> and I've been practicing, I'm in my fourth year of practice, and um, I have my degree in architecture, so I like to think that I at least know where, you know, the design professionals are coming from. All right, so we're going to start with the tripartite relationship. Um, the architect and the owner, of course, have a contract. But it's important to keep in mind that the owner and the contractor have a separate contract. And essentially what the A201 does um, it's a link those two, but they're still two separate documents. <clears throat> That's why it's very important to have a coordinated to have coordinated contracts and not to mix and match the contract families. So not to use the AIA documents with the consensus docs or um, anything else. You know, use the same family of forms in in order to keep the different forms. Owner to architect, owner to contractor, contractor to subcontractor, consistent. And something important to note when you're going through this slideshow is the red plus sign. Um, it, there, there are going to be slides that have the red plus sign and maybe sometimes two red plus signs. Those are very important for um, indicating that the information might be on the exam. So a double plus sign means it's definitely going to be covered on the exam. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, those symbols. And here is just a basic comparison of the, the three most popular um, families of contract forms. And you can see the AIA and the EJCDC documents um, are similar and there are some things about the consensus docs that are different. Um, so take a look at that. Um, like Don was saying, the AIA documents have been around for a very long time, since 1911. So they're time tested and um, are, are good things for design professionals, architects, engineers to utilize in their projects. And here's a general outline of the A201, the table of contents. Um, again, it's a little con <laughs> confusing with the use of general. We have uh, general, general provisions, and then as Don mentioned, there are general requirements and the specs. So just try to keep them uh, try to keep them separate um, in your mind. Um, and the the entire form is called digital oh. conditions. So very confusing, but um, hopefully some memorization will help you in that regard. <clears throat> And so what the general conditions do, uh, the A201, it just it defines basic rights, responsibilities, and relationships of the parties involved in the performance of the contract. So we're going to touch on owner responsibilities, architect, engineer responsibilities, um, contractor responsibilities. So it, it's a document that tries to tie in everyone's responsibilities together so um, the team can work as efficiently as possible throughout the actual construction project. And keep in mind, as an architect, you cannot recommend which general conditions of the contractor for the owner to use because that would be practicing law. You don't you, want to give any legal advice. You don't want to give legal <laughs> advice if you're not a lawyer. Uh, if you're a lawyer, you can do that. Um, so 
And the same thing with the with the supplemental conditions. If there is something that the owner, say, wants to change or modify in those general conditions um, in the A201, uh, make sure that that it is written down and documented and it's not uh, something that you just simply talk about with the owner. All right, and those legal issues, we try to keep them at a minimum. Um, as a lawyer, I can tell you that this is very true. The discovery phase, basically, uh, I review from the very initial, be very beginning of a project, um, you know, architectural drawings and specifications through the permit process all the way through construction and then even after. So documentation in a clear, written, accurate, and professional format. I cannot emphasize how important that is. Um, the types of handwritten notes I find on some, even my own clients' documents are sometimes outrageous. So just remember, um, even if you're typing an email or something, just imagine how you would feel if that uh, email or note would be re read aloud during a deposition. That's what I try to tell my clients when they're, uh, you know, um, putting anything in writing. So just keep that in mind. Great advice. <laughs> I tell my husband that too. <laughs> All right, so the standard of care, in um, at least in the legal aspect, is again something we argue over day in and day out. Basically, as a design professional in Florida, you are going to be held to a higher standard of care than the average person. So the um, the standard of care for you be to be held not negligent in your profession is basically um, this the same course of action as another reasonable and prudent professional, so another architect or engineer, under the same circumstances. So think about how uh, an architect or engineer in your firm or in your city or in your county or even in your region of the state um, would handle something or would design something or you know types of codes they would be required to to follow you know you're going to be held to the same standard as other design professionals in your circumstances so um, the standard of care is very very important and of course design professionals are uh, required to comply with the building codes and laws ordinances and regulations at a minimum remember that's a minimum um, and ultimately more may be required. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're looking through your contract documents. And the Spearin Doctrine, it comes from an old case uh, that basically says that the contractor is not responsible for the consequences of defects in the contract documents. So essentially the contractor is entitled to rely upon the contract documents um, that they're given the drawings and the specifications, uh, the contractor is going to rely on those documents for their intended purpose. Um, the four C's of the CSI world, which we will talk about over and over and over, and I, I suggest you commit them to memory, not just for the test, but just for your practice um, in a, every day. Uh, clear, concise, correct, and complete. When every drawing, every set of drawings, every spec, you know, Keep those four C's in mind. Amen. <laughs> and um, the courts will interpret the specifications in the same manner as they interpret contracts. And the some common rules of contractual interpretation are listed here for you. Basically, uh, autonomy of contract. Um, the written document is the entire agreement. Um, the specific provisions take precedence over general, more boilerplate provisions, trade customs, practical interpretation, construction against the drafter. And depending on, uh, you know, what state you're in, those will be uh, taken into consideration by a judge or whoever is determining in a certain order, but it's important to keep them in mind. Getting into the general provisions of the general conditions, so Article 1. <clears throat> this is essentially a list of the contract documents. So what you do not see on that list, as you'll note, are shop drawings, um, <laughs> napkin sketches, that sort of thing. Um, and the contract documents do, not, do include written forms, 
So the contract documents do include written forms of modifications, which you'll see there at the bottom of the slide. And emails might be considered a written amendment. So again, be careful what you put in writing. Here are some uh, more basic definitions. The contract documents essentially form the contract for construction. And again, note that there is no contractual relationship with the architect, consultants, contractor, subcontractor, or materials suppliers. There is a tripartite relationship through the other third party agreements, but the AE and the contractor do not have a contract with one another. That's why it's important to get uh, similar contracts from the same family. And the the other important definition here is uh, the work. So the work is going to be whole or part of the labor, materials, and equipment. Essentially, the project, and if it's not the entire project, specific parts of the project will be defined by contract. So just keep that in mind as you're going through your contract. The owner, uh, you know, the owner could perform a part of the contract separately. For instance, if there is a tenant build out, shell, space that's going on concurrently, or maybe a certain fixture or AV equipment installation might be going on con um, concurrently, but might be a separate part of the work as defined in your contract. The project as a whole is the total construction um, of the work performed under the CDs. And if there is a component that's going to be constructed by others or provided separately, then it needs to be spelled out clearly in the document. So um, do not use you know, a phrase like by others. I would specifically use by owner or by separate trade contractor. Because there, you know, there are, these terms need to be defined. We, we will have defined owner, so if it's a separate part or piece of the contract or work that's going to be performed by the owner, don't be afraid to say that. Spell it out. Yeah, it's an important comment to make because uh, you, you'll often see, especially on some engineering documents, where they'll uh, they'll say uh, on the mechanical drawings, you know, uh, electrical component by others. Well, that's incorrect. <laughs> that means that means it's not part of the project. It's outside the project. All the documents are being directed towards the general contractor. And keep in mind that, that the exam is mostly based upon the concept of a designed bid build with a single entity as the general contractor. Here are some more basic definitions. Some of them drawings and specs are somewhat self-explanatory. Um, if you look uh, at the initial decision maker, uh, a relatively new entity within the A201 and is set up for impartial claims resolution and it's it's really commonly defined as the architect however it might be an impartial third party so if it's not going to be the architect then it should be someone that all parties agree to and has a significant related project experience maybe a famous architect someone who understands contracts <laughs> don copy <laughs> All right, so intent of the contract documents. <clears throat> this is a very important concept. Again, you'll keep in mind the four C's, clear, concise, correct, and complete. Um, and they directly relate, this directly uh, related to this contract provision. So uh, performance is based on what can be reasonably inferred by the documents, and we litigate what reasonably inferred means. Um, but that, you know, make it as clear as you possibly can because the contractors are not mind readers. So if you want something specific, put it in there, spell it out for them. Uh, there's an old military adage, if an order can be misunderstood, it will be. So don't repeat things over and over that might get changed later and then in one area of the document it doesn't get changed to um, reflect that and then a conflict results. So just, you know, the coordination of documents is so, so important. Yeah, and it helps uh, again to be generic in your in your documents at times too, in particular uh, when you're 
putting things on drawings versus what's in the specifications. Uh, we've had we've had situations where the drawings call out for a particular finish on the aluminum storefront, and the specs call out for a different finish yeah. on the aluminum storefront. So. Uh, so do you typically on drawings would you say see specification for no, finish? No, we, you we would just, just just leave it blank and blank? let them go to the specifications okay. to figure out yeah. what it's supposed to be. Because that's you know we go through those things. 10 years later after the project's been built and how you know looking for those types of uh, conflicts or inconsistencies so <clears throat> all right ownership of the instruments the architect owns the documents unless it's spelled out differently within the contract and this is uh, unique really to the uh, AIA documents yes uh, most of the other documents that you'll see of the general conditions especially uh, owner written ones the owners always claim to have a have a stake of the ownership of it. And when you get, you know, if you get something like a supplemental conditions or uh, an owner or that wants to use a different form that you're not familiar with, you know, it is a good idea to have to compare it at least to the A201 or have someone compare it for you so you can really point out some, you know, as in your day to day practice, you know what the differences are as you're performing the work. Speaking of the owners. <laughs> All right, so the owner will be identified in the document in the agreement, and the owner must designate a representative authorized to bind the owner for future modifications or directives. More likely than not, the owner is not going to be on site every day, but they will likely have a representative there, and that person or entity must be able to um, bind uh, the owner. And, and these are some important things for the contractor. Uh, you know, the owner might be requested to provide assurance of funding for the project. Um, the owner is going to be responsible to provide a survey and that sort of thing. Um, for example, the building and site permit fees might have been paid for by the owner as part of the pre-bid process. Um, utility and tap fees, that sort of thing. Uh, but the contractor would be responsible for building inspection fees. So the owner has the right to stop work, not the architect. The architect does not have the right. The only way the general contractor can, um, the general contractor may stop work for non-payment. Again, the architect does not have the right to stop work. And so if you see something wrong out on the job site, yep. being built wrong, or it is built wrong, you cannot tell the contractor to stop right. doing the work. What's recommended to say to the contractor is, if you continue to build it that way, it will be rejected. And usually they'll stop doing what they're doing. And it's good to put all that stuff, you know, if you see something, don't keep it to yourself. You know, talk to the owner about it and that sort of thing. Uh, try to keep an open dialogue. All right, so the owner has the right to carry out the work uh, and can correct deficiencies in the work. Um, if the contractor defaults or neglects to carry out the work in accordance with the contract document. And it, the owner has the right to self-perform the work or correct deficiencies. However, there is a formal written notification process required 10 days before the owner takes responsibility. So, you know, the contractor is going to have a chance to respond to this problem. Yeah, they'll have a cure period, as it's called. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the contractor, also known as Big Bad Wolf, <laughs> just kidding. The success of any project is uh, is working as a team, and you have to keep a level and objective viewpoint throughout the entire project delivery process. Keep in mind that everyone has rights and duties under the contract. Yes, sir. All right, again, the contractor is going to be identified in the agreement. Um, they have to be properly licensed. And they are the contractor cannot be relieved of responsibilities by the architect or by building officials or authorities having jurisdiction. The work must be performed in accordance with the contract documents. Therefore, it's very important to obtain things in writing and document changes. This includes such things as product substitution. So get it in writing. Yeah, just keep in mind that even though the architect may say verbally that it's an acceptable substitution not written down it's not an acceptable substitution if it hasn't been made into a change order or an architect supplemental instruction yep 
All right, so the contractor will also review field conditions, and this is important for the contractor um, because essentially the contractor represents that he's generally familiar with all aspects of the site. Uh, but of course, this does not include hidden conditions such as hidden utilities or bad soils, that sort of thing, things that are not identified on the survey, like such as abandoned landmines or Indian burial grounds <laughs> or Jimmy Hoffa's body, <laughs> those types of things. Um, so it's important when that when the hidden conditions are uh, discovered that they are uh, you notify the owner immediately. <laughs> The flip side of it is, is that they are responsible for studying the documents, mm -hmm. going out to the field, verifying the conditions prior to start the work of what's actually out there. So it's visible. You know, they can't turn around and say, "Geez, I did, I didn't know that there was a uh, an overhead power line there." And it, you know, that's a good thing to do. It's a good thing you know to have maybe a pre-construction meeting to just go through those drawings and that sort of thing to, to talk about those kinds of. Um, things that might come up as well. So the supervision and construction procedures, the contractor and only the contractor is responsible for means, methods, techniques, sequences, procedures, and coordination. Um, so the contractor shall supervise and direct the work using the best skill and attention. And that is the contractor's responsibility to maintain job site safety. Yes. And this, you know, the contractor is responsible to the owner for acts and omissions um, of the contractor, responsible for inspection of work already performed uh, for proper condition to receive subsequent work. Labor and materials. The contractor is required to pay for the cost of performing the work, which includes all of these elements that are listed for you. Uh, note that water, heat, and utilities are generally temporary, and only during the course of the work, once the owner accepts the building, these may become the owner's responsibility. However, some of these elements may, in fact, be part of the final scope of work, um, meaning that they are permanent installation components contractor is still required to pay for these if required in order to complete the work. So an example of this might be an elevator that's used for vertical material delivery and you know in lieu of a buck hoist or a temporary ho hoist. And the, and the contractor is also responsible for protection and operation and power for this component until turned over to the owner. Labor and materials continued. Um, the contractor may make substitutions only with consent of the owner and after evaluation of the architect. So substitutions are allowed, um, but a pro the proper procedure needs to be followed. And uh, it's, <laughs> this is very important, say in condominium work, which but makes up a large portion of my uh, con con construction litigation uh, caseload, uh, because the condo association might sue the developer or owner the architect and the contractor for illegal substitutions or substitutions that were not approved. So um, write it down. Get approval, write it down. <laughs> Another component of this is that the contractor is responsible for enforcing strict discipline and good order among their employees out on the job site. Yes. And they're not to employ any unfit persons or persons not properly skilled. And the contractor is warranting that the materials and equipment are in accordance with the contract documents, new and free from defects. And that contract provision um, is a very, very important one in my line of work. So new and free from defects. If found out later that is not, then uh, the portion of the work or equipment that may be found um, defective will probably need to be corrected. A quick story I could tell is we had a project in which the contractor was reusing the concrete formwork two by fours <laughs> to use as wood studs for the partition oh, on no. the inside of the building. And there was nothing in the specs that say that he couldn't do that except for this particular line yeah, in which it says, warranty says it's got to be new material, <laughs> not reused. 
and that's where we where we hung our hat on. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, permits, fees, notices, and of course compliance with the law. Um, the contractor has certain responsibilities with regard to the building permit fees and licenses, that sort of thing. Um, and if the contractor performs a work contrary to any of the following items listed, such as laws and statutes, codes, that sort of thing, then the contractor assumes responsibility and bears costs for those items to be corrected. So what do they do if uh, there's a drawings are in conflict with code? they need to ask for clarification. So again, this is um, a good thing to have a drawing review or uh, with all the team members prior to construction starting, but the, the contractor needs to ask for clarification before starting the work. Um, you know, the contractor is ultimately obligated to meet the code requirements. Um, the ADA requirements, for example, um, you know, that's a good example of this potential conflict or some Fair Housing Act minimum door width and that sort of thing. So um, if it's unclear, then the contractor needs to ask for clarification. But if they build it per the drawings, the architect's problem. Mm. The joy. <laughs> All right. We briefly touched on this. The contractor needs to provide notice to the owner and architect if uh, these conditions are encountered, bad soils, hidden conditions, that sort of things, foundations of old buildings or adjacent building might be uncovered. So notice, prompt notice is required. Allowances. Um, allowances might be used for materials that are not necessarily selected at the time the contract documents are issued for bidding. For example, carpet or AV equipment, that sort of thing. So allowances need to cover the entire cost of work, labor, material, delivery cost, taxes, et cetera. And they're usually going to be charged on a unit cost basis. And any balance within the allowance not billed is credited back in the form of a change order, including the GC's overhead and general condition costs. Superintendent shall be employed by the contractor, and he or she should be competent and um, have competent people working for the contractor. Super, um, the superintendent, the owner and the architect must also not have an objection to the superintendent. If the owner and architect do have objections, then the superintendent can be removed from the project. However, the GC cannot remove or change the superintendent without approval. Construction schedule is also important, and the contractor will prepare that schedule along with the submittal schedule. So the submittal schedule I know is very important to the architect, and this will be used to measure performance. Um, make sure that adequate time is built into the schedule for review of those submittals. Um, the schedule must be practical, it must be achievable, um, and you know, keep in mind it may require revision during the course of the work. The submittal must be um, maintained on site at all times. This is a good test question. Um, but the, the contractor is required to maintain certain documents and um, drawings, specifications, change orders on the project site, at the project site, in good order. And those submittals, the, those could be a lot. That could be a lot. So keep that in mind. And keep in mind, it doesn't say you have to have the paper copies. Ah, true. Very true. So they, Who's in the electronic age now? If they're all electronic, <laughs> we are uh, uh, a laptop in the, in the job site shack is good enough to yeah. meet that requirement. And I feel like logs, and we'll get to this with the RFIs, but any kind of, anytime you can list things and keep a log of something like a submittal or an RFI, it's always a good practice, I think, um, not just during the project, but after the project Absolutely. Um, as well. All right, so here are some um, defined terms, shop drawings, product data, samples, and similar submittals are not considered contract documents. The purpose is to demonstrate to the contractor, 
for the contractor to conform with the information given in the design concept expressed in the contract documents. Submittals are not required by the contract documents, and um, if they're not required, then they may be returned by the architect without action. And um, that's, I would highly suggest that architects make that their typical practice. So if the submittal is not required to have been submitted, then return that thing to the contractor. A good example might be a material safety data sheet. Uh, these are not and should not be reviewed by the architect. Safety uh, should remain the general contractor's responsibility. So and don't take on more responsibility than you need to. And it's recommended that when you return those, you return them rejected. Okay. And rejected for the reason that they weren't required. Gotcha. Because you don't, again, you don't want to take on that added responsibility. Right. And putting that stamp on there is always uh, Correct. controversial. All right, so uh, shop drawings continued. Um, essentially, the contractor shall review the submittals for compliance with the contract documents, approve them, and then submit them to the architect. By submitting the submittals, the contractor represents to the owner and the architect that he or she has reviewed and approved them, um, determined and verified the uh, contents, and has checked and coordinated um, those submittals with the requirements of the work and the contract documents. That so, is their responsibility. Yeah. And, uh, and a good test of a good contractor is to see how well they do in actually reviewing the submittals before they just forward them on to you. And so the no work, the contractor shall perform no work until those submittals have been approved by the architect. And again, the work should be performed in accordance with those submittals after going through all that trouble. Um, However, they don't overrule the construction documents. True. Very true. Um, the, the contractor is still obligated and bound by the construction document requirements. Um, something to keep in mind, that there are some instances where the contractor might be required to provide um, engineering services for exterior windows or maybe a pre-engineered roof structure, something like that. Um, and that's typically going to be spelled out in a performance type specification. So even if the por even if the spec does not necessarily say this is a performance spec, um, it might simply list the requirements or parameters to be achieved. Um, and in most cases, there is a requirement for assigned and sealed engineering drawings. Stipulated, however, a spec might not necessarily stipulate this and may just list a standard requiring compliance. Another good example might be a fire rated joint system or a support system for equipment. Use of the site, the contractor um, <clears throat> should again follow the, the laws, statutes, ordinances, codes, etc., and should not unnecessarily and reasonably encumber the site with materials or equipment. Pretty straightforward. Yep. Cutting and patching. Um, if you cut it, you fix it. The, the contractor is responsible for uh, cutting, fitting, and patching, um, and restoring the areas to the condition existing prior to. And this is critical to talk about, especially when you're doing phased work or mm -hmm. if you're doing construction management type work with multiple contractors. Uh, CM's responsible for doing that coordination and uh, making sure that the building is still weather tight or operational, or, uh, et cetera. So again, the contractor is responsible to keep the site clean. Um, free from accumulation of waste materials or rubbish. We had a case once where um, we had duct work. Not we, but our, you know, someone, the, the contractor, uh, was discovered that the duct work was basically being used as a trash chute during construction. So um, all this debris was recovered from the duct work, and they were wondering why the AC was not functioning as it should have been. Um, but basically, the contractor used it as a, as a trash chute. So, um, not a good thing. The contractor should keep it clean. And if they don't keep it clean, the owner can do so and then turn around and charge the contractor for Correct. the cost. Right. Take it off their next uh, pay application. Great. And the contractor cannot deny access to the site. So the contractor should provide the owner and architect with access to the work in preparation and progress. 
And the A201 specifically says that the contractor shall pay for royalties and license, license fees. Um, the, the only time that might not occur is the, con the contractor is not responsible for such defense or loss when a particular design process or product of particular manufacturer is required by the contract document. And this is a disadvantage of a single source type specification. Yeah. Having just one single source. Indemnification, this again, is very important. Um, and the contractor is required to indemnify and hold harmless the owner, the architect, and the architect's consultant from claims, damages, losses, expenses, et cetera, from the performance of the work to the extent that is caused by the contractor's negligent, negligent act or omission. And this basically prevents subcontractors or suppliers from suing the architect or the owner, basically preventing third-party claims. Correct. The good guy, the architect. <laughs> the good witch of the East. The architect, of course, will be identified in the agreement, um, and there will be a de designated representative that has the express authority to bind um, the Let's see, if terminated, if the architect is terminated, the owner shall employ successor architect as to whom contractor has no reasonable objection. And this uh, talks about the architect's duties, basically providing administration of the contract as described in the contract document. Uh, the architect will be the owner's represent representative during construction generally, um, and then we'll have the authority to act on behalf of the owner to the extent provided in the contract documents. Again, look look at the definitions and how the parties are defined, if there's a separate owner's rep or um, you know, a, a third party neutral, you know, just keep that in mind. But another thing we like to talk about during depositions um, are how often the architect visited the site, uh, what intervals are appropriate. And I can tell you that there's no, you know, black and white rule on this, but the architect is not required to make exhaustive or continuous on-site inspections to check the quality or the quantity of the work. So the architect just needs to be generally familiar with the progress and, the, and uh, uh, to be able to basically know how much work has been completed, I think. We don't inspect, we just observe. And I think, has that been changed in the, the language? That's something That's right. architects are catching on to that. So they will definitely say that. <clears throat> the architect will not have control over these things. Again, we already mentioned means, methods, techniques, sequences, etc. These are specifically the contractor's responsibilities. So the architect will keep the owner reasonably informed about the progress and the quality of the work um, and will and should report to the owner known deviations from the contract documents, the deviations from the schedule, um, any observed during your observations, any observed defects or deficiencies in the work. So. But we're not responsible for the contractor's failure to perform the work in accordance with the contract document. And so you cannot you, stop, the architect cannot stop the work. And you but. can't stop the work. So if, if something is, is built and uh, you didn't see it, or even if you did see it um, and you forgot about it, it is, and they can't say, well, the architect saw it and didn't say anything about it, so it's fine. Now, if it's not in accordance with the contract documents, uh, it has reasons to be rejected. And along those same lines, um, you know, what you exactly what you just said on the architect will have no control over or charge of many acts or omissions of the contractor, subcontractors, their agents, their employees, etc. So. All right, so the architect will review payout. <clears throat> so, based on the contractor's application for payment, the architect will review and certify the amounts due and issue uh, certificates for payment. The architect does have authority to reject non-conforming work um, and to require inspection or testing of the work, whether or not fabricated, installed, or completed. This is important because, um, again, the architect has the right to reject non-conforming work 
and require the testing or inspection, but not to stop that work. So if the work is required to be uncovered or redone, um, the architect needs to be on you know solid ground when requesting this. Because if you uh, if you tell the contractor to uncover it, and you find out that it was installed properly, um, then the contractor is uh, going to be uh, able to get a change order from the owner to uh, repair what he had to tear out. The owner's not going to be too pleased. All right. Um, the architect will review and take action on the contractor's submittals for the limited purpose of checking for conformance with the information given. Don't take on more responsibility than you need to. Um, the design professional has a limited role during the review of shop drawings. However, this is that design professional's last line of defense for quality assurance, quality control efforts. So, you know, it is it's to your advantage to check those shop drawings thoroughly in those submittals. And if you make a change to it, which is the shop drawings is different than what it shows on the construction documents. You need to issue a change order or you need to issue an ASI. Uh, simply changing the shop drawings uh, does not make it part of the contract documents. And that's important to document. And uh, if you go 10 years down the road and the HOA turns around and finds right. an error, they will find that issue and, uh, and there will be grief. And the, the shop drawing approval process, as you're saying, should not be used for substitution requests or product, product change approvals. So if a product change is submitted, then it should be returned without approval to the architect, by the architect. Without approval by the architect. All right, so here are some of the, the ways that changes can be documented and should be documented. So the architect will prepare change orders and construction change directives. Um, they will uh, issue an ASI for minor changes in work, and uh, CCDs, or Construction Change Directive, these are directives when a price cannot be defined or determined. So if time is not critical to a proposed change generated by the architect and a change proposal is submitted by the GC, this might be turned into a CCD, and then several CCDs might be, become grouped together as one change order once the pricing is resolved. So the, the CCD authorizes the GC to proceed with the work until that price is resolved either by lump sum or by a time and materials basis. Um, so additional backup might be needed or supporting information might be needed. Um, and it's a good recommendation not to do CCDs unless you're absolutely forced to, because basically you're telling the contractor, go ahead, Here's a blank check. start construction, not a blank check, but we'll figure it out later. Right. And then figuring out later turns into, can turn into quite a mess. All right. The owner, if the owner and architect agree, the architect will provide project representatives at the site. Um, the architect will interpret and decide matters concerning performance under and requirements of the contract documents on written request of either the owner or the contractor. So an on-site representative is, again, not an inspector. And there will be limited duties and responsibilities with usually an added service. It should be an added service. <laughs> Get, you know, yeah. negotiate your terms so it is an added service. You know, it's important as a design professional not to overcommit uh, your time and your resources without proper contracts. So, anyway, the interpret interpretations and decisions of the architect will be consistent with the intent of or reasonable, reasonably inferable from the contract documents. Um, and you really try to show no partiality to the owner or the contractor. Um, you know, remember, you guys are all working towards the same common goal. Um, not liable for results of interpretations or decisions rendered in good faith. So, um, the interpretations need to be reasonable, you know, fair and reasonable, and the architect needs to be fair to both parties. So. Um, it. The architect or engineer does have full control over aesthetic decisions, and those decisions are final. The architect's 
primary role during the construction phase is to review and respond to requests for information or RFIs. Um, some contractors use this as a tool to illustrate deficient drawings or build a case for a claim for delay. So this is very important for an architect to respond timely within a short period of time, um, get the information to the contractor as soon as possible, and you know, keeping the number of RFIs that are necessary throughout the project low is always the best course and can be, um, you know, it's not a, I, there's always going to be at least one RFI, but you know, the four C's that we were talking about are a helpful way to keep the RFIs to a minimum. And it's good to have just a good working relationship with your contractor yeah. to be able to call you so that every little question doesn't come out as an RFI. So. Yeah. Uh, and if there are RFIs, again, keep a log of them, the date they are received, um, the date that the response was issued, that sort of thing. Um, you know, you want to you wanna just document, document, document. <clears throat> Subcontract. All right. So these folks are working for the contractor. Um, they are contracting directly with the contractor to perform portions of the work at the site. Sometimes they're referred to as trade contractors. Yeah. The architect uh, or owner can object to a subcontractor. However, if this adds cost to the project, then the owner may be on the hook for the difference. Um, not common, but can happen if there has been a bad experience with the sub or there's an ongoing legal dispute for another project, an objection might be uh, forthcoming. So. So the subcontractor agreement is subservient to the owner general contractor agreement. And uh, for the most part, uh, especially if you use the AIA forms, that subcontract is going to incorporate the prime contract or the otherwise known as the owner general contractor agreement. If the general contractor is terminated, uh, the sub can remain with the project and and the contracts can be reassigned or assigned to the, the owner or maybe a different contractor. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, that the owner has the right to carry out the work or per portions of the work. Um, you know, but the owner shall coordinate activities of the owner's own forces and the separate contractors with the work of the contractor. So you want to be efficient as possible and work together um, so you have very little, you know, as little cutting and patching and, and you know, somehow affecting the work of others, um, other contractors on the site as possible. Keep in mind, it, it's the owner's responsibility to coordinate their own forces mm -hmm. with the contractor. It is not the architect's responsibility to coordinate that. It is not the contractor's responsibility to coordinate these subs. The it is the owner. And this goes into a little bit more detail in that the contractor has a um, the, the contractor shall afford the opportunity for storage of materials and that sort of thing, allow the performance of other activities um, by the owner, connect and coordinate contractor's construction and operations with theirs. Um, if the if the contractor's work depends on the owner or separate contractors, then the contractor needs to report any um, discrepancies or any potential delays uh, to the owner. Uh, for, for instance, you know, if uh, the movers for the owner are ready to deliver furniture on a predetermined date, um, but are delayed uh, because the uh, general contractor did not notify the owner, maybe, you know, has, the area hasn't been painted or the paint is still wet, in the storage, you know, the furniture can't be uh, delivered, then storage needs to be figured out and uh, there are going to be costs incurred, incurred and remobilization re of those movers. So um, it needs to be, there needs to be coordination and um, the work of the general contractor um, needs to be coordinated in a way that um, it's with the schedule, it's on time and that sort of thing. That's the best way to prevent these types of conflicts from happening. Owner's right to clean up. Pretty self-explanatory. 
Um, notice is required. So this generally just applies when there is a dispute on who has to clean up after the owner or specialty contractor has been on site. And there is a mix of trash or debris from many sources. So um, the owner has the right to clean up. This concludes part one of the session and we will have part two coming up here uh, shortly.